Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game for Scratch, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game engine that you really probably shouldn't be using, but you probably should be aware of it, and that is this fellow right here. This is the Spartan engine. Uh, this was actually the work of a developer in an area where there wasn't much of a game development industry, so he wanted to prove he had the chops. He created this engine, and as a result, he got a job first at Sony, and then at Codemasters, and then finally at AMD, and he's continued to develop this engine after the fact. What you're seeing in front of you, this is uh, a creation, recreation of, what is it, Ghost of Tsushima, the uh, dynamic um, grass being implemented procedurally. We've got something like 8,000 trees in this world. The total space of this is something like 68 kilometers squared, maybe a little bit less than that, but still, and it's an impressive feat. So it gives you an idea of what this engine is ultimately capable of. It's also an entirely open source project. So Spartan Engine, I covered this one, I think, about four years ago, and it's continued to develop since then. So if you want to go ahead and check this one out, this is the editor side of things. If you want, there are a number of worlds that ship with it. So here you can see this is the open world forest we've been looking at here. Let's go take a look now at, say, the Minecraft demo. So let's quickly load that one up. So here you can see more of a uh, Minecraft style going on. You get an idea of the performance as well. The performance is quite good. Uh, so while you wouldn't use this to create your own game, you may use it to create your own game engine. In fact, the uh, Temporal Anti-Aliasing or TAA solution from Spartan Engine was actually used in the Godot game engine. So uh, if you are looking for... Um, you know, uh, a reference point or how to do something. This is exactly what this engine is all about. You could use it to make your own games as well. Just know you you don't have documentation. The editor isn't that polished, etc. But you do have a lot of nice worlds to work with. On top of that, we have a number of tools built in here as well. So you can see over here, for example, we have a profiler available. Uh, we have um, rendering options. So if I wanted to say, here, here you can see that temporal anti-aliasing, for example, or uh, fast approximately anti fast approximated anti-aliasing. If I wanted to have uh, VHS effect or dithering, I've got those available here as well. We've got fog and then various other things here uh, as well. Again, you do have this profiler for the CPU and the GPU. Uh, we have a texture viewer. We can go ahead and check out all the various different shaders that go together to make everything here work. Uh, and let's just go show you a very simple example. So go to world selector. We're going to select basic. So you can see also there's a Sponza and a car showroom of one available as well. But the basic one is, well, it's basic, which is useful. So what you got here, this is a uh, base 3D world. You've got a physics ball in the world. You've got a physics controller with a camera attached to it. Uh, you got floor, lighting, and so on. I can go ahead and import in 3D models. So for example, here, I click the import button. I will go to models and let's just bring in a rock. So let's load in a rock. You see, this is an OBJ file. You could also bring in uh, FBX, etc. Decide what you wish to do with it. And then boom, that should have imported a rock. Uh, it didn't, not sure why. Let's try a different rock. Uh, so again, this is one of those things I find where you may not necessarily want to use this for your own. Uh, okay, so we got doesn't exist, doesn't exist. Okay, not sure why. Let's try my rock again. All right, it loaded that time. So again, you do have some things like that that you're going to experience. Again, why you would not want to use this in production. There you see a 3D model. You can bring in uh, models of a variety of different formats. Now we can do another thing over here. So let's go ahead and create a 3D object of type cube. There is our cube. Oops. I grabbed the wrong thing. The nice thing you'll notice there is there is also an undo, which is nice. So let's grab there, move this over and across. And then you see here, there's various different uh, components attached to it. We'll add a new component of type physics. We'll create this of type box. We will make it so that it is static. We will give it some mass. And let's go ahead and preview our work. There you go. So that is how things work, at least on the editor side of things. This has all been running from a Visual Studio project. You want to go ahead and get started with this one. It is pretty simple. What you do is you go over to the GitHub for this project, which we will come back to in just a second. But you come here to this GitHub. You come in here and you clone the repository right here. Uh, and then you're going to need to have Python installed. With Python installed, you go back over to the, the generated directory, and then you run generate v Visual Studio 2022 Vulkan. Direct3D12 is a stub, so you definitely want to create the Vulkan version. And then you just load it up in Visual Studio, like I have right here. Now, the key thing that you're going to want to do is jump in. If you want to figure out how code works, especially because you don't have... Um, 
any documentation for the most part. There's a wiki that has like build advice and that's about it. So this is where you're gonna figure out how things work. So here you're gonna see all of what we just ran, it, the editor is being loaded and created in this project, project called game.cpp. So when you're first checking things out, it's game.cpp that you're gonna wanna look at first. So here you can see the editor. This is the main loop of the editor. So this is called every frame each time it ticks, it does all of these things. Here's the construction stuff uh, and so on. So that is the, the enter, entry point for the editor and then game is the heart of it. And this kind of shows you kind of everything. So here's how, you can, for example, you would load music uh, and set the pitch, set the audio clip and so on. Uh, so here you can see how components are added to entities. All of the code is documented here, game.cpp. And then again, the entry point for the level editor is an editor.cpp, same basic concept. So you can go on through here, there's creating 3D models, here's creating a 3D module from GLTF file and adding it to the world and then adding physics to it. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Again, you're not documented those. So you're gonna wanna be able to read code. If you can't read code and understand what's going on here, if what you're seeing on screen in front of you is just completely alien to you, this is not meant for you. This is not an engine of that purpose. Because so you see right here, Spartan Engine is one of the most advanced one main game engines out there. It even comes with a podcast. It is built for research and experimentation, ideal for industry veterans, not individuals looking to build a game. So this is more, again, reference. So if you want to create your own game engine or you need to figure out how to create a specific feature, or maybe you want a framework to test out some graphics, you could start with this as a, as a learning point. Now what you'll find is though, it is a single developer behind it. There's also 23 contributors to this project now, which is quite nice to see. The project itself is written mostly in C and C++. On top of that, you will see that this is, again, MIT code licensed. It has uh, two and a half thousand stars. So it's a popular project in that regard. And again, he started off and he created this to get a job. Uh, you know, he was in an area where they didn't really have jobs. So he went ahead and created this. Um, and then he's continued to work with it since. So you actually see like his CV, uh, he's worked at AMD, Codemasters, Sony Interactive, and then again in Greece, some smaller things like we're talking Ludum Dare stuff. Like so all this earlier stuff is very not going to get you a job in the industry. So that's where he created the whole uh, Spartan engine. The entire idea behind it was to be able to get a job. And that's how he got into these other positions. So uh, if you're interested in getting things going, that is one way you could do it. Again, you have to also have the technical chops to be able to build something like Spartan engine and Sparta is impressive. So again, the temporal anti-aliasing, for example, from the Godot game engine, from Spartan, as I said. So this is, uh, again, an interesting project. It reminds me in a lot of ways of another project I covered in the past, which is called the G3D Innovation Engine. This isn't an engine, again, that is used for uh, actual game creation, but it is a proof of concept for a number of different techs. And again, it's very robust and mature, like what you will get from the Spartan game engine. So both of those, if you're looking for how other people made their own game engines in C++, Spartan and G3D are great places to start. Now, I don't know if G3D is still getting updated, but Spartan definitely is. You're getting pretty much continuous updates. The last one was a couple of days ago. So that is very cool. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the Spartan game engine. Again, don't use this to create your own game, but you could potentially use this as the starting point to create your own game engine if you so wish to do so, or if you just want to look behind the scenes, something a little bit more contained, you want to figure out how game engines work, could be a good place for you there. So ladies and gentlemen, Spartan Engine, let me know what you think. Comments down below. I'll talk to you all later. Goodbye.